Welcome to the Healthy Living Series, a series of talks brought to you by the University of Alaska's Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning in partnership with Foundation Health Partners. My name is Joan Braddock and I will be your host for this summer series. The Healthy Living Series has been a lecture series held in person in past summers. The COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines required that we rethink the format for this series this summer. We are delighted that KUAC has agreed to support the new format for the series as a weekly TV broadcast. We are also very grateful to our speakers who are willing to be incredibly flexible in adjusting to this new format and appreciate the time they are donating to help us all live a healthier life. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to let you know that you will be able to view the talks online after they have aired by going to the UAF Summer Sessions' website at uaf.edu slash summer slash events. I am delighted now to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Rommel Wren. Dr. Wren is a cardiologist at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital specializing in cardiovascular medicine and interventional cardiology. He received his doctorate of medicine at Tulane School of Medicine and did an internship and residency at Brook Army Medical Center. He holds board certifications in internal medicine, general cardiology, cardiovascular CT, interventional cardiology, and echocardiography. On a personal note, Dr. Wren enjoys pursuing his hobby of astronomy. Tonight, Dr. Wren will be speaking on determining coronary heart disease risk. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Romel Christopher Wren. I'm an interventional cardiologist here in Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm associated with the Porter Heart and Vascular Center at um, Fairbanks Memorial Hospital, Foundation Health Partners. So today we're going to um, have a presentation that I'm going to give on determining coronary risk disease um, in the general population. And we're going to look at the role of the coronary artery calcium score in determining coronary heart disease risk. What are the objectives? Well, we'll define atherosclerosis versus arteriosclerosis discuss current understanding of the atherosclerotic uh, calcification process, list methods of determining cardiovascular disease risk, review potential consequences of untreated atherosclerosis, look at a few risk calculators, it's mainly for healthcare providers, so we won't spend a lot of time on that, but I'll show uh, several risk calculators, and uh, we'll explain the value of coronary artery calcium scoring in determining cardiovascular disease risk. And I'll also present some preliminary data from the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital coronary artery calcium score study that uh, will be completed within the next, uh, well at the end of this month the study will be completed. So let's look at cardiovascular diseases and uh, arteriosclerosis versus atherosclerosis. Well, arteriosclerosis is the loss of elasticity of the arteries. They become thickened and hardened. And part of this process um, of hardening the arteries is due to atherosclerotic calcification. Now, atherosclerosis is a process where there's fatty material deposited in walls of arteries. Material thickens, hardens and can eventually obstruct the blood vessel when this plaque ruptures. Now atherosclerosis is just one type of arteriosclerosis. So if we look at the atherosclerotic process, um, an example would be here in the top left, we look at, here's an artery, uh, here's an heart um, demonstrated on the CAT scan and there's no calcification, there's no hardening of the arteries at all versus just top right, there's a little bit of calcification, see the bright spot here, a, a bit more calcification, and then heavy calcification in the blood vessel at the bottom, bottom right, where this coronary calcium score is 1200 versus a calcium score of zero. This calcification, we used to think, was related to just 
calcium being deposited in the walls of arteries. But now we know that there's, this is a very active process where the process is very similar to wh what we see in bones where bone has been deposited, where there are osteoblast cells that lay down calcium and osteoclast cells that remove calcium. So there's a very active process going on in these blood vessels to cause calcification. And this process occurs when there's inflammation. It turns these cells on to cause calcium to be deposited in a very active process. So let's move on to determining increased risk for future cardiovascular disease. How do we know if someone is at risk? Well, can you just look at a person and tell? We wonder, you know, if one is overweight with stage three obesity, we know that that can lead to problems. However, we just can't look at someone and really know. We do know that anyone over the age of 75 is at high risk for cardiovascular disease. Anyone in Western civilization over the age of 75 would be high risk for developing cardiovascular disease. Who is at very low risk? Well, if you have a total cholesterol of less than 150, blood pressure that's normal, less than or equal to 120 or 80. If you're not diabetic, you do not smoke, no premature family history of heart disease, and you don't have metabolic syndrome, then your risk for developing a heart attack or stroke is very low. What about metabolic syndrome? Well, if you have three of these conditions, elevated triglycerides above 150, low HDL cholesterol less than 40 in men, less than 50 in women, elevated blood pressure, elevated fasting glucose above 110, waist circumference in a man greater than 40, or waist circumference in a woman greater than 35. Any three of these out of the five would constitute a metabolic syndrome where one would be at, inc be at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. If we look at body mass index, what's stated is that a body mass index between 18.5 to 25 is healthy. What's interesting is that lately, um, it's been suggested that we should look at um, the SMART BMI calculator. Uh, and that's online at smartbmicalculator.com. And that ties in your gender and your age to give you a better um, outlook in terms of the meaning of your BMI and whether you're too high or too low. We know that uh, <clears throat> elevated BMI is related to, to um, disease. So premature death, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, and some cancers and diabetes. So keeping the body weight down between, with a BMI between 18.5 to 25 is ideal. And again, you can calculate your BMI by going to smartbmicalculator.com. Now, a few words on risk calculators. So when you go to see a physician, if a, you know, the healthcare provider, the advanced practice provider, may use the ACC ASCVD risk estimator, and that, I would say that's the most common one used. There's also a Reynolds, Reynolds risk score. The Mayo Clinic has a shared decision-making cardiovascular uh, primary prevention choice tool. And there's also what's called the MESA risk calculator, which uh, is rarely used, but uh, one that can be used. If we look at the ACC ASCVD risk estimator plus, it is based on a pooled cohort equation that, oh, that can estimate the risk. Now, it may overestimate the risk uh, in people uh, with a 10-year risk greater than 10%. A 10-year risk of a heart attack or stroke, if it's more than 10%, it may overestimate the risk. Older persons with, without long-standing risk factors may also be overestimated, and we'll talk about that a bit more when we look at the coronary calcium score study. And those patients who are at higher socioeconomic status may also um, be more likely to have a healthy lifestyle and be on preventive drug therapy, so this calculator may overestimate the risk.
It can under, underestimate the risk in uh, persons with a family history of premature vascular disease. It can underestimate the risk uh, in people with chronic kidney disease and also someone with chronic inflammatory diseases. So a younger person who may have a low risk score may actually be underestimated because of these factors not being taken into account. That is family history, chronic kidney disease, and chronic inflammatory disease. So the app looks like this. This is the ASCVD Risk Estimator Plus. Anyone can use this app. You go in and you um, plug in the data, current age, your gender, race, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, LDL. Is there a history of diabetes? Is one a current smoker or not? If we were to use uh, this and, pl uh, and, and put in some data, let's use a 66-year-old male African-American, blood pressure 145 over 90, total cholesterol of 220, HDL of 60, LDL of 90, no diabetes, not a smoker, not on, uh, does have high blood pressure, not on a, uh, on a statin, yes, take an aspirin, no. And if we look at the risk, up here we would see that, if you put in all this data, the 10-year risk for developing a heart attack or stroke is 20.2%, which is very high. That's high risk. So that's how that calculator is used. So in general, with this risk calculator, one would say this person needs to take a statin, or certainly make lifestyle changes to try to bring uh, the blood pressure down, bring the cholesterol down. Uh, and if one were to make those changes, then what we would see would be that um, lower blood pressure, uh, continue using the statin to the point of bringing the cholesterol down, we can see that optimize this patient's risk factors, we can reduce the risk to 7.5%. So we can go from 20.2% to 7.5% by lowering the blood pressure, lowering the LDL, the total cholesterol, and um, possibly by also increasing um, HDL. Uh, also adding aspirin would also benefit the patient. So the Reynolds risk calculator uh, performs a little better uh, than the uh, AHCC um, ASCVD calculator in some higher socioeconomic and lower risk cohorts. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but let's just look at it. Um, now here's what the risk calculator looks like online. Again, you put in the age, smoking history, blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, uh, it also adds the high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. Now, HSCRP, high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, is an inflammatory marker. Um, if it's greater than three, that's bad. If it's less than one, that's extremely good, and we like to see it certainly below three. So we take this calculator again and put it on a patient's age, 66, blood pressure, 145 systolic, total cholesterol, 220, HDL cholesterol, 60, High sensitivity C reactive protein, we would say is two. And it does look at family history, but it does not look at, uh, at, at race. Uh, it does look at gender, and it's our patients again, it's the male. And if you look at this, it says that the 10 year risk was 14%. Okay, still high, but not the same number as with the ACC ASCVD risk calculator, but still uh, very high. Um, if we look at Mayo Clinic's shared decision tool, one can go online and look at that. And actually, with the Mayo Clinic tool, when you go into it, it will utilize data from either the ACC, American Heart Association, ASCVD uh, risk calculator, or the Reynolds risk calculator, or the Framingham. So you use one of these calculators and then input the data into the Mayo Clinic decision tool. And again, we use the same patient, age 66, a male. It's not a smoker, no diabetes, no family history, and not taking a statin. We put this information in, and what we find is that it says, yes, this person has a 14% chance of having a heart attack. So 14 people would have a heart attack with these 
numbers, 86 would not. But then it goes a step further. What if we add a standard dose of a statin? Then we show that now we go from 14 individuals having a heart attack to improving to only 11. Three people would be saved by adding a standard dose of a statin. If we were to high, add a high intensity statin, then the Mayo Clinic decision tool tells us that now only eight people will have a heart attack. Six will be prevented from having a heart attack. So it shows you the benefit of using a standard dose versus the high dose statin with this uh, risk uh, or this decision making tool. And then also with this tool, it gives information on how much it would cost for a statin, about $150 a month for a high dose statin. And uh, it also talks about certain side effects of statins. And for the healthcare provider, it allows one to document that the decision tool was used uh, to share with the patient about the uh, interventions that could be done and about the benefits of doing this intervention. So this is sort of involved, but it's a nice clinical tool that, that a healthcare provider can use. But again, most healthcare providers would use the ACC ASCVD risk calculator. The MESA risk calculator has been used in a study called the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. And it's, an, a, again, another risk calculator that can be used. Okay, and again, the same information with looking at uh, race, di uh, diabetes status, smoking status, family history, total cholesterol. Let's use our 66-year-old male. Now, this calculator also looks at what's called a coronary artery calcium score. And I assigned a calcium score of 320 to the patient. The ideal score is zero. Very high is 400 and above. Low calcium score is anywhere from zero to 100. Intermediate is from between 100 to 399. So this patient, they were assigned a score of 320. African American, total cholesterol again 220, HCL 60, blood pressure 145 systolic, and uh, not on lipid lowering uh, medication, I mean, on lipid lowering medication and also on uh, antihypertensives. And so the calculated 10 year risk with this information is. 17.2%. So all these calculators will give you, in this guy's case, um, elevated risk, a very high risk. So what are some of the tools that have been used um, in the literature to determine risk? High, sensitive, high sensitivity to C-reactive protein has been utilized, measurement of apoprotein B, which is a, a way of measuring the amount of cholesterol is, that's uh, having to be handled by the body. The GFR, or the glomerular filtration rate, looking for microalbuminuria, looking for small amounts of protein in the urine, family history, cardiovascular fitness, the ankle brachial index, or ABI, coronary artery calcium, and also the carotid intimal medial thickness. So these are various tools that have been utilized. And of those, only four have been recommended by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association to guide us. So family history, what, someone having a first degree relative, male less than 55 or fe uh, female less than 65 with a uh, cardiac event. Or high sensitivity to C-reactive protein greater than two. Coronary artery calcium score greater than 300 or se greater than 75th percentile for age, sex, and, and, and ethnicity or ankle brachial index less than 0 0.9. So these are the four um, tools that are recommended for use by healthcare providers to determine if someone is at increased risk. Let's take a closer look. If we look at uh, the carotid intermedial thickness versus coronary calcium score, with the <clears throat> using ultrasound, we can measure the thickness of the lining of the carotid artery. Um, this, this was popular uh, probably about 10 years ago, not so popular now because it was not found to be as predictive of who we're going to have a heart attack. Uh, however, we do know that if the 
wall of the carotid artery is thickened, that would suggest that there's increased plaque formation throughout the body. So if we look at the inner lumen of the carotid artery, there's the intima and the media. So the thickness of this intima and media is determined with ultrasound. And if this is greater than about one millimeter, it's generally associated with increased plaque in, in different portions of the body. Well, there are some challenges with the anteromedial thickness. And uh, one of the problems is that interpreting the results from clinical trials is different because of the, the way it was measured. And that is, do you measure where there's no plaque, where there's a small amount of plaque? Um, the precise definition of which segment of carotid to be used has been a problem in various matching, matching studies. Do you look at the average or the maximum thickness? It's also a challenge. Do you look at the near and far wall or only the far wall of the intermediate thickness? The angle may vary. If the angle is, is uh, too steep, <coughs> then that can increase the, uh, the measurement. What about manual tracking versus automatic, uh, automated software? That's another challenge with performing intermediate thickness testing. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, do we include carotid plaque or not? So these are challenges with measuring the intermediate thickness. And <clears throat> what's also been found is that um, the increased carotid intermediate thickness may requalify a patient to a higher level um, but only about 1 to 2% per year. So it doesn't make a tremendous difference in, in reclassifying someone to at being at risk versus not being at risk. So it's fallen to the wayside in terms of our using it as a tool to determine who's at increased risk. What we do use more often now is the, carotid, the coronary calcium score, or do coronary calcium scanning. So this is a CAT scan of the chest that's gated, and that is, is ECG triggered. So to measure um, the amount of calcium in the coronaries, it's ECG triggered, so there's not a lot of blurring uh, of the blood vessels. And the scan thickness is three millimeters, so there's not a lot of radiation that's gonna be used because there's not very thin slices of the heart that we're looking at. <coughs> so this has been used since 1990, and it was first used by Dr. Agustin, who published a standardized method for quantification of coronary calcium that he called the Agustin score. And it's based on the area of calcified coronary plaque in a CT slice and a density factor. Now this score gives us an idea of what the, the risk is of having significant coronary plaque. But it does not reflect a pathophysiological variable. That is, you can have coronary calcification, it does not mean you have symptoms. So a score of zero means there's no identifiable plaque. A score of one to 10, minimal plaque. A score of 11 to 100, definite plaque, but it's mild. 101 to 400, moderate plaque. Greater than 400, there is significant plaque. And increased risk for multivessel coronary disease. If we look at the difference in coronary plaque with, between the ethnicities, we find that um, there are significant differences in the prevalence of coronary, uh, coronary calcification. Uh, if we look at, uh, in women, particularly uh, Hispanic women, have the lowest prevalence of coronary artery calcium. So Hispanic women. Caucasian or white women have the highest prevalence in, in women. Chinese and black women being intermediate. Black men have the lowest prevalence of coronary artery calcium, whereas Caucasian or white men have the highest prevalence of coronary artery calcium. This is important. The prognostic importance of race in the risk assessment of coronary artery calcium has not been established. So the, the answer is that, oh, the mean, this means that your score matters, not your race. Okay, so a score of 300, uh, or let's say a score of above 400 is, is, um, 
is, is, is dangerous or significant no matter what your race or et et ethnicity is. So it has not been determined that the score varies, that, that they, the score means more in one person versus another depending on race. Uh, and then data from the MESA study suggests that there were no significant race-related differences in the prognostic importance of a certain score. The predictive utility of calcium scores, again, independent of race. So here's a CT scanner at, over at FMH with an individual on the table about to undergo a scan. I have that person's permission since I'm that person on the table. Um, so this is not my scan, thank goodness, however, but here's an example of a scan showing severe calcification. When you see these bright white spots here, that's coronary calcification. Now we know that no one is born with, with plaque in the arteries. So we're not born with atherosclerosis, but with time, so here's an infant aorta that's clean, free of any plaque. With time, there's a buildup of plaque in, in blood vessels, particularly in Western nations. So here's a 42-year-old male, and you can see the plaque on the walls of this, of this blood vessel. Here's a 65-year-old male, and there's even more plaque in the walls of this blood vessel. This is actually, this is taken from uh, the uh, 1968 Life magazine, pictures by a photographer by the name of Len Leonard Nielsen. And then here's a 82-year-old male, and his aorta is, is loaded with, with plaque and cholesterol deposits. We call that a shaggy aorta when we see all of this, we're going to see this amount of plaque. And it's actually dangerous for us to do procedures because as we pass catheters through a blood vessel like this, this plaque breaks off and can cause blood vessels to clog up downstream. So as plaque develops, finally there's an acute event. So what would happen? Well, here's an example of what can happen. Here's a 40-year-old female with a plaque that's ruptured, and this artery is almost blocked completely. We had to go in to do a balloon angioplasty and stent to open this artery up. So if a plaque ruptures, one-third of patients may have chest pain, one-third may have a heart attack or acute MI, and one-third may die suddenly and never make it to the hospital. So this is why it's so important for us to try to determine who's at risk so we can see if we can determine or do something to reverse or stabilize the plaque before an event happens. If you have plaque in a blood vessel in the brain, uh, if there's narrowing, one may have what's called a transient ischemic attack. If the blood vessel closes off, one may go on to have a stroke. Again, if an artery is narrowed in the heart, one may have chest discomfort, angina. If the artery closes off completely, one can have a heart attack. If there's narrowing in a blood vessel in the leg, then one may have what's called claudication, pain in your leg when you walk. If there's a problem with the plaque in the aorta, it may dilate, become enlarged, develop an aneurysm, and may rupture. What do we do about these things? Well, with the heart, we can do a coronary stent. We can do coronary bypass surgery. But these procedures can be dangerous. So it's better for us to determine who's at risk and try to stabilize, try to reverse the risk or stabilize the plaque so there's not an acute event. So here's a patient. Uh, with no coronary calcification, very low risk. Here's someone with a calcium score of 29 who's at low risk. Here's someone at intermediate risk because the coronary calcium score is above 100, below 400. Here's someone at very high risk, coronary calcium score of 1,200. The uh, American College of Cardiology and, uh, has suggested that we use coronary calcium scores in adults age 40 to 75, people without diabetes. And the reason why is that if you're a diabetic, then one would say that you should take a statin no matter what. All diabetics should take a statin because of the extremely high risk of having, of going to have a heart attack or having already had a small heart attack. So all diabetics should take a statin. So we don't have to use a coronary calcium score to determine whether one should take a statin or not. But even in diabetics, if we do a coronary calcium score, we can do more risk stratification. If the 10-year risk is greater than 
5% and between less than 20, that is if there's intermediate risk, that's an ideal person to look at a coronary calcium score. Because in this group, in this intermediate risk group, if the coronary calcium score is zero, one can argue that one does not have to take a statin. And if the patient is not so sure that they would want to take a statin, even at high risk, that is if the, if the tenure risk is greater than 20%, that's high risk. If one is not sure that one would want to take a statin, then we can do a coronary calcium score to see if it's zero. And if it's not, if it's high, then that may help the patient and the physician, the provider to decide, yeah, let's go on to use a statin. And I mentioned using a statin, but of course we do want to use um, lifestyle modification. Try exercise, try, try uh, changing how we eat to lower the LDL, the bad cholesterol, to try to stabilize reverse plaque. When we do lower the LDL, the uh, cholesterol, we like to see it below 80 is good, below 70 is very good, good, and below 55 is excellent for the LDL cholesterol. Uh, so if someone has coronary calcification, what does it mean? Well, it means that you do have atherosclerosis in this blood vessel, and higher levels of coronary calcium correlate with higher risks. Zero calcification, none seen, suggests a very low probability of obstructive disease and less than a 1% chance of a heart attack or stroke over the next five years. So it's like a five-year guarantee that, almost guarantee that you're not gonna have a problem. That's the power of zero. If we look at this study by Matthew Budoff, published in 2007, looking at 25,000 patients with um, coronary calcium scores. For a score of zero, uh, these patients uh, essentially had no events over this period of time. And uh, these patients were followed, I believe, for three years. And you look at scores of um, 799, there was a 10.4 uh, increased risk that an event would occur. So the 10 year survival uh, after adjustment for risk factors, including age, was 99.4% for a coronary calcium score of zero. So 10 year survival was 99.4%, whereas for a score of above 1,000, the um, 10 year survival was 87.8%, so significantly reduced. And that's p-value much less than 0.01. It was 0.0001. So if we look at the risk adjusted relative for the risk ratios for the uh, coronary calcium scores, uh, it was 2.2 relative risk, 4.4, 6.4, 9.2, 10.4, and 12.5 for those scores of 11 to 100. Now that's, that's interesting because that's, it starts at 11 to 100, and that is, a score of zero is great, but you know, a score between one to 10 is very good also. So any score 10 and below is extremely good. And scores above um, 400, uh, certainly very uh, high risk. If we look at the MESA study, that's the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, three and a half year follow-up in patients, the higher the score, the more likely one would have an event. And so when scores above 300, there was a 14-fold increased risk for an event within three and a half years. So what does the cardiologist need to know in terms of coronary calcium testing? Well, we need to know when to consider testing. And we need to understand the power of zero, that a score of zero is outstanding. Not everyone benefits from a calcium score, so we have to be selective in this use. Again. In my practice, it's generally women between the ages of 55 to 75. And I would modify that and say 55 on up. And in men, 45 to 75 or 45 on up for men. I don't, we don't have to use 75 as a cutoff. And, and one reason is that the coronary calcium score can be useful in older individuals because um, an older individual may have a very low coronary calcium score. And that would mean that person should ha not have to be relegated to taking a statin.
So we should consider coronary artery calcium testing in intermediate risk or selected borderline risk adults. If the decision about a statin use remains uncertain, it would be a time to do it. And it would be reasonable to use coronary calcium score in the decision to withhold, postpone, or initiate statin therapy. Now, in terms of the coronary calcium score, it's generally not paid for by insurance companies. Um, Presley and Fairbanks, the score costs $500 that insurance companies won't pay for, uh, but that's subject to change um, next year. In Anchorage, the score can be obtained um, at Alaska Heart Institute for about $110. But we hope to see a change with reducing the cost at FMH, but that won't happen prior to getting a um, vaccine for COVID-19. Well, um, and then with a the hospital can get back in, um, in better shape and then in terms of taking care of non-COVID patients. Okay, um, so here's a suggested guideline and that is if someone has intermediate risk based on the ASAV risk calculator, and that is anywhere from five up to uh, 20%, if the score is zero for the calcium score, then a statin is not recommended. If the score is greater than zero and you're at intermediate risk, if 7.5 to 20% statin is recommended and it should be considered even at five to 7.5, consider a statin. But again, this is the power of zero that shows us that if the score is zero, we don't have to take a statin unless you're at very high risk, above 20%, 10-year risk for an event. So in adults, 76 to 80 years of age with an LDL cholesterol level of 70 up to 189, it may be reasonable to measure coronary calcium to reclassify those patients with a score of zero to avoid statin therapy. So it can make a difference. Even at age 80, one may have a score of zero. And if so, there's no reason for a statin. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the um, coronary artery calcium score study that's been done at uh, FMH. It's called the coronary artery calcium uh, scoring, the role of coronary artery calcium scores in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk stratification. The hypothesis is that Knowledge of the coronary artery calcium score in asymptomatic intermediate risk individuals, males aged 45 to 75 or females aged 55 to 75, knowledge of that score will reclassify greater than or equal to 50% of individuals to either high or low risk. So here's the information from our study. So far we've analyzed 204 patients 44% of males, 56% females, and we have reclassified, that is, using coronary calcium score, we reclassified from intermediate risk to either high or low risk, reclassified 121 patients or 59%, which is our hypothesis that we would reclassify more than 50%. And uh, when looking at this information, um, in terms of uh, the mean age for females was six, about 63.4 years, the mean age for males uh, 60.9 years, and this was significantly, uh, significant difference at a p-value less than 0.05, not less than 0.01, but uh, less than 0.05. And uh, I'll make a point about this later, and that is, uh, on average, the women were older, which stands to reason because we used 55 to 75 for women, 45 to 75 for men. So we had slightly older women uh, than males in this study. If we look at the, uh, this is a busy slide, but I want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, the number of patients that we reclassified from intermediate to zero, the number of patients that were reclassified were 59%. Now reclassified from intermediate to zero were 18% of the patients, or 37 patients. There was one patient reclassified from high risk to to zero. This is important also. Patients on, um, on statin uh, therapy, there were intermediate risk, reclassified to zero, uh, there were nine patients. The total number of patients on statin therapy were 85. 
So about 10% of the patients on statin therapy were reclassified to zero, meaning that one could consider taking these people off statins. If we look at the males versus females, there were, uh, in terms of the score of zero, there were 79 individuals with a score of zero. Of those 79 individuals, 57 were female, 22 were male. So um, the percent of individuals with zero, of the ones with zero, 72% were female. Of patients with a score of zero, 28% were male. If we look at the, the effect of the coronary artery calcium scoring on our patients of 203 of the patients, then it was significant to a p-value less than 01 that the coronary, measurement of coronary calcium made a difference. Highly significant, less than p-value less than 0.01. So some conclusions from our early data was that 59% of patients have been reclassified, which um, met our, our hypothesis. The addition of coronary calcium affected a significant change in risk classification with p-value less than 0.01. About 10% of patients on statin therapy were reclassified to zero, which is very important because if we don't need statin therapy, then we shouldn't give it. So final tidbits. So currently coronary calcium scoring is feasible at less than one millisievert. That is, the radiation dose is very low. In fact, in our study, the amount of radiation in this, for the average patient having a coronary calcium score was less than the radiation used in a mammogram. So very low dose radiation. Now, despite the significant role of coronary calcium testing um, in our current guidelines, this test is not widely, co widely covered by insurance companies, which is a problem. So that's why they, we're trying to get the cost down. Now there's a high yield of calcium scores above 400 in uh, stress testing. About 35% of people with a score greater than 400 will have an abnormal stress test. And in fact, uh, in at least two of our patients who are asymptomatic, who had scores above 400, uh, ended up with markedly positive stress tests, and at the time of cardiac catheterization was found to have critical uh, left main coronary disease and ended up needing to have coronary bypass surgery. At five years, 25% of patients with a score of zero will convert to more than zero, but even with that, the score remains low at about 19 for those uh, individuals. Um, so again, the score, uh, score of zero is, is, is impressive. If someone does have an elevated score that is greater than zero, then one does not need to re repeat the test. There's no reason to repeat it because if you have coronary calcification, you have it. It's not going to go away. If the score is zero, it is reasonable to repeat the test in three to five years as if it remains zero. Okay. So this is our final tidbits, and I would like to thank uh, the university for allowing me to spend this time with you to go over this information, and um, we look forward to next year. Thank you.